take a shot every time you've heard a contestant say, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here for a competition not to make up and make a friend, so. We have gotten so used to hearing such statements that we don't really assess them for what they are, toxic. But one contestant did. He questioned the humanity of those who are willing to do whatever it takes to win a competition, even if it means having no empathy for others. He writes, I wish that phrase was illegal. It clearly displays what capitalism has done to the American psyche. This win at the expense of everyone else is the Achilles heel of capitalism, which is certainly the best economic system we've got, but is far from perfect and cannot operate purely on its own, simply because of that statement. Because when humanity is disregarded in favor of winning, evil things happen, lives are destroyed, and that eventually brings everything down. Amen. And this, my friends, is season two contestant Ben Starr. I like this all the time! What's the matter with you? Delicious, really nailed it. Congratulations, good job. Final. He was a total sweetheart, a burst of sunshine in a show otherwise filled with pettiness. His positivity and support for everyone are qualities I wish more people had today. Humble, enthusiastic, and kind. He was just the best. In his blog, he wrote, if people entered a competition with personal integrity and compassion for their rivals, we would see a far more captivating and interesting competition. I will always share ingredients with a competitor, even if I have to rethink my dish and go without, especially if that competitor has been mean to me previously. I will always stop what I'm doing to help someone in need, even if it means I lose. Because in the end, I don't lose, I win because I gain the respect of the audience, the respect of my loved ones, and the most important respect of all, self-respect. Sure, self-respect doesn't pay me 250 k but that money will be vanished in a few years anyway, and I'd be left with my lack of self-respect, despised by the audience for competing selfishly, and my personal integrity in question by the people who love me the most. What price are we to put on our humanity? Anyway, maintaining that attitude in a show designed to strip away your humanity for the sake of good TV is truly amazing. Hats off to him. Throughout the whole process, he remained incredibly positive. What a wonderful, gentle soul. I'm sure you'll like these insights after getting used to the usual cutthroat nature of the show. And I'll admit, most of my videos are also about those. Back to Ben, he's now living his best life, foraging through the forest. His laid back, easy sourdough videos on YouTube are absolutely brilliant. He started posting again recently, and I really hope he keeps it up. His videos are incredibly informative for anyone even remotely interested in cooking and a treasure trove for those looking to pursue it professionally. We're not using whipped cream. Shortcakes were really popular for the advent of refrigeration. Now what makes him stand out as the most important contestant from MasterChef is his ability to maintain his integrity throughout the show. He never badmouthed or antagonized anyone, which is rare in such a competitive environment. More importantly, his brilliant expose on how fake the show really is serves as a wake-up call for us as viewers. He reminds us to exercise caution before passing judgment on the contestants. He also challenged the format of MasterChef, which I'm sure most of you all will agree with. Questioning the inconsistencies, he wrote, The strongest competitor can get eliminated on a single challenge of the only thing she or he's weak on. And while she or he may be stronger in 99% of challenges than all the other contestants, a single falter can get them eliminated. That's not fair to begin with. The proper format for a cooking competition like this is for every contestant to stay the entire season and participate in every challenge, and the overall winner of the most challenges wins that coveted MasterChef trophy. But then, there's no suspense from episode to episode, so you stop watching so you can thank the short attention span of the American audience for driving reality TV to the engineered elimination format. Do you agree with his views? Me? I think he absolutely nailed it. 
In 2013, he also called out social media trolls who were taunting deceased Season 3 contestant Josh. Ben wrote, Josh had an incredibly difficult time dealing with his experience on MasterChef, as many contestants from former seasons have. Some top 100 contestants from the season are still wrestling with suicidal urges. That was so telling. This is exactly why we must remember to be kind on social media, as in real life. And most importantly, not jump to conclusions. Ben also played the devil's advocate and defended the most crucified contestant in the show's history, Chrissy. Ben wrote, I know a lot of you hate Chrissy right now. That's exactly what the producers want you to do. That's why they cast Chrissy. That's why they held her hand all the way into this spot where the country is heaping hate on her social media. They want this. Because the more you hate Chrissy, the longer you'll tune in, waiting to be satiated when she's finally eliminated. Which will happen. Because whatever villain they decide to create, they'll never let win. Because MasterChef is a good show, bizarrely enough. While the throat-slashing, bus-throwing under, ultimate supreme backstabber may win Hell's Kitchen or Survivor, MasterChef hasn't yet given itself over to that genre quite yet. Even though all we're being shown this year is savagery, someone we all love is going to end up winning. Probably Jordan or Luca, since they're not going to let a beautiful girl win for the fourth year in a row, or the audience will cry foul. I actually know who wins though, so perhaps I'm leading you all astray. So Chrissy has no chance of winning MasterChef. Not because she's not the best, but because she was cast specifically to be the villain this season. And when she finally falls, she'll fall so epic and so hard, and all of America will pounce on her like a pack of wolves, greedy for her blood. I cannot get behind Chrissy's racist tweets in real life. But I have to agree with Ben on one thing. Reality TV producers, like in MasterChef, are expert manipulators. They can easily create villains of contestants. Now, Ben also claims that MasterChef is completely fake. According to his blog, contestants' comments are often stitched together from random bits recorded over the whole season. He explains how they constructed a sentence from snippets taken from different interviews spread across various times. He clarified that what aired on TV was never something he actually said. The show's editors entirely fabricated it. Willie from season five said the same. I felt as though some of the truth was too much for them. He also exposed some serious behind the scenes chaos alleging that contestants are deliberately stressed to provoke emotional reactions. According to him, they're sometimes locked in hotel rooms with no freedom to leave and have all contact with family cut off for weeks. In certain seasons, contestants were even woken up in the middle of the night, told to pack, and relocated to a different hotel room. Starr claimed the goal is to induce frustration, sleep deprivation, and confusion about where others are staying. Apparently, contestants on the show often lose their sanity during filming. They spend six weeks in Los Angeles without contact with their spouse, children, parents, or friends. They can't even inform their employers where they are going, just that they might be away for up to two months leaving many wondering if they'll still have a job when they return. Their day typically starts early, around 5 or 6 a.m., with a quick yogurt smoothie from the hotel fridge before they stumble down to the lobby. From there, it's a chilly van ride to the set, where their day oscillates between mind-numbing boredom, like waiting for four hours in a silent holding area before filming, and intense stress ranging from cooking challenges to agonizing over mistakes. The day ends in an elimination, and contrary to the edited portrayal, no matter who's going home, it proves deeply disheartening and sad for everyone involved. The ordeal doesn't end there. After more waiting, contestants endure a grueling two-hour interview dissecting every aspect of their day. These interviews aren't just about feelings, they're invasive, crafted by a psychologist who observes their every move on camera and delivered by a skilled story producer 
intent on evoking the same emotions felt throughout the day. Then, at 3 a.m., a loud, abrupt knock jolts them awake. It's time to move to another hotel room. They hastily pack up all their belongings, everything they've brought for two months of filming, and relocate to a room on a different floor for reasons that seem inexplicable, adding to their confusion and stress. If they're lucky, they might settle back in by 4.30 a.m., just enough time to catch a brief 30-minute nap before starting the grueling cycle all over again. So what Ben's saying in his blog is, give these contestants a break. Don't jump to conclusions based on what they say under pressure. Enjoy MasterChef like you would any other scripted show. Sit back, relax, and take it all in as engineered fiction. Anyway, like I said, he was a treat to watch. And one of my favorite moments was in episode 10's pressure test. They had to whip up a six layer cake in just two hours. No small feat, right? The goal was to nail the construction, make it look fantastic, and of course, taste incredible. Everyone seemed to be sweating it out. But then Ben stepped up with his pumpkin carrot cake topped with cream cheese and candied hazelnuts. Cake for five years is the first time I have had the ingredient that represents me truly as a cook. It looked like a fall dessert, cozy, inviting, and warm. So yay, definitely Ben on a plate. Looks phenomenal. Thank you, chef. Ramsey also called it magic on a fork, and Graham was so blown away that he was too stunned to speak. Just letting it finish, my mouth just had an orgasm. <laughs> that cake hit a whole new level of culinary ecstasy. He's spoken to the judge, my language, this is Ben Starr. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. It was definitely an emotional win for Ben. Pass the tissues. Ben Starr has arrived. Oh my God. The next important chef on my list is him. You know, have to take me with a grain of salt. Love or hate him? You have to admit, we all need a Tommy in our lives. Gordon Rams loves my dish so much. He excelled at creating unique dishes, stayed organized, and maintained a positive attitude even when everyone else was losing their minds. He kept his cool until they started yelling at him for no reason. Honestly, I would have said much more than just shut up if everyone had been picking on me like that. And while many may said that he was all style, no show. Remember that Ramsay himself admitted that. But now you can really cook the part. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, Tommy has proved his haters wrong many times. We met in in the first EP of season six. His mission? To unleash an avalanche of style, to put couture on a plate. Before diving into the cooking, he mentioned that. I want that MasterChef apron more than I want Chanel Haute Couture dress. Well, that's how you know he was serious. He then mentioned that he was 53, probably the oldest contestant that season. No way! I'm not cut. It's all real. Amazing. Yep, the man had no Botox done. The judges were surprised, and so was I. I only have one ring, and I sit on it. <laughs> That's one of the best one-liners in MC history, no cap. Tommy had a remarkable career. He was a faculty member in the Department of Accessory and Conceptual Design at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, one of the most influential schools in the US, according to Columbia University, for 20 years. He also served as the chair of the Department of Design Arts at the National Young Arts Foundation. According to Wikipedia, this foundation was established in 1981 by Lynn and Ted Arison to nurture emerging high school artists. Now, he's a brand ambassador for the Daleman Group, a global company known for making Stroop waffles. Though some might find him a bit eccentric, his talent surpasses that of most contestants on MasterChef. Now back to the auditions, Tommy was cooking pork. But right before plating, he realized his tenderloin was still raw inside. Tommy's tenderloin is raw in the center. Ah! Overacting aside, he quickly tossed it into a pan to finish cooking. When the time was up, he threw his hands up like a gymnast nailing a perfect landing. Although his pork ballotine didn't look as pretty as his dishes at home, the judges agreed it tasted great. It's moist, you got that sear around the outside. I'm amazed you got it cooked. Good job. And he progressed to the competition, 
cut to the dreaded pressure test of episode 4. So you're a man of fashion. Let's admit many of us watched this season because of him. Everything the man says is hilarious. The contestants had 45 minutes to get a dozen cinnamon rolls into a box. Gordon set Tommy up, saying that he expected his creation to match his flair and flamboyance. A man of art, style, panache, flair. What's inside the box? Tommy responded, saying, Tea filling, cinnamon, allspice, pistachio nut. When Gordon lifted the lid to check, his expression quickly changed. He blurted out, asking, Is that? <sighs> Sorry, Tommy, I cannot defend you on this one. Ramsey then said, Well, that's the first for me, a sick box. The box contained a green and tan mess that he clearly felt embarrassed about. Tommy, staying optimistic, compared it to his first tuxedo. Gonna come out great, but hold it's on. always number two and number three. He thought he ate with that comparison. One mouthful of that, and I'm sure I'll be going for number two. Ouch. But in his defense, I to take something ordinary, change it into something grand. Now, although it looked disease-ridden, it was also alluring. So somewhat like a Timothy Chalamet. There are bits in there that taste decent. But Ramsey's final verdict was a health warning. Do not open in broad daylight. Ouch. Next, we see him in the 100th episode of MasterChef. The 14 contestants were hauled out to a vineyard on a cliff in Southern California, not for a wine tasting, but to cook 50 dishes for some culinary big shots. The team challenge? Whip up an appetizer with oysters and caviar and an entree with duck breast. Easy, right? The judges went on about making history and how everything would be stunning and amazing before finally getting to team selection. Now Tommy was picked last, and what he said made me a bit sad. It feels like being in grade school again when I'd be the last one to get picked. I think it was probably because he was gay in Louisiana in the 70s, and not white. He probably went through hell. He was underestimated, and you'll see how. The cooking kicks off, and those smoked oysters are already causing havoc in the red team, especially with everyone's tear glands. The smoke makes Olivia squint, but it's even worse for Christopher, who is in charge of the smoking station. Now there's a big debate on how long it really takes to smoke an oyster. Tommy, claiming his Creole roots give him an edge with shellfish, insists they should just get a kiss of smoke. No, not six minutes, that's an overcooked oyster. They just have to be touched by smoke. On the other hand, Christopher and Olivia swear by a solid six minutes to cook them through. I know oysters cooked, grilled, raw, flambéed, and Thanksgiving stuffing. Gordon Ramsay strolls over, pokes at them with his all-knowing finger, and lets out a string of colorful words. The f they're all overcooked. Did you test one? Nothing. Turns out Tommy was onto something, and his team should have shown more faith in him. I hate to say it, but I told you. Next in the 10th episode, the top 11 hopefuls saunter into the kitchen, led by Tommy sporting a necklace straight out of Star Trek. My ancestor, Creole, so I'm representing that voodoo side of- As they lift their lids, lo and behold, a deluge of rice spills out, covering every inch of the place. <laughs> oh, jeez! Oh! Spare a thought for those poor production interns who had the joy of cleaning up this completely avoidable mess. The rice showdown begins, and like clockwork, everyone parades out their life stories through their dishes. Claudia's whipping up Latin flavors, Patel's sticking to traditional Gujarati, Shelly's bringing in coconut and island vibes, and Tommy's keeping it southern. My family, Louisiana, though I've lived all over the world, still a southern boy. Fox, we get it. Your show's the UN of culinary diversity. Graham starts off by gesturing towards Tommy's entire getup and remarks, I mean, we don't know too much about you aside from the glitter and the show. <laughs> Easy there, Graham. Judging based on appearances is for the shallow folks and TV critics. No one's commenting on your bold glasses, your love for colorful bow ties, or your ink. And this looks like the first time that we get the rustic Tommy. Just taste the food, man. He wasn't gonna turn into Thomas Shelby in a day or with one dish. His jambalaya, which by the way, looks pretty darn good, 
was an ode to his roots. This dish is dedicated to my Aunt Lorraine. She made everything in a black cast iron skillet. Describing the roast, he said, The rice actually green bamboo rice adds another layer of perfume. Graham digs in and loves what he tastes. Tommy. Oh, finally. Graham. Beautiful, yummy, this is you. And Gordon, trying to be profound, accidentally ends up making a quip about sleeping with Tommy. And I want Tommy the dream. I want to wake up with you. The food was that good, it could make you gay. Not with you, no. <laughs> Ruth, come down. Okay, I stand corrected. I want to wake up remembering how good you can cook. Yeah, there you go. Tommy clinches the win and secures that prize spot in the household magazine. He's over the moon, giving yet another shout out to Family Circle, who must be paying for every mention by now. This is the beginning of my dream of my Creole cookbook. And his win included him getting to choose the fate of his opponents in the pressure test. Power and control. I just love it. Next up in episode 13, the top nine chefs gather for the mystery box challenge. The lid lifts to reveal liquor and matches. Gordon Ramsay announces they'll all be flambéing something. I've been called first. The judges are gonna be quite impressed today. Yep, they were. Tommy steps up first with his bananas foster. With maple and bourbon cream garnished with Granny Smith app. Looks yum. Gordon praises it as beautiful and honestly, it did look pretty amazing. Incredibly fragrant. And you haven't just done the sort of cheap flambe because the whole crepe is colored beautifully. Don't forget to check out my video on the top MasterChef dishes you wish you could try. Anyway, after tasting it, Gordon declares it delicious. I love what you've done with the saviness of the cream cheese inside as well. Delicious. And Graham chimed in to agree. Great flavor. I love the use of the bourbon. I love the whipped cream. His dish made it to the top three, but didn't win it. In the pressure test, they had to cook chicken waffles. Chicken wings, my chicken drumstick, they look like solid gold. I'm seriously considering inviting him over to whip up some duck fat fried chicken for me. He pairs it with a pecan quinoa corn waffle and whiskey marmalade. And my grandmother always kept a coffee can of duck fat. That was saying nothing went to waste. Gordon is all praises. He's used words like incredible in another league and a chef's dream, which clearly means Tommy's nailed it. It's authentic, it's delicious, you, you're frying duck fat. Which I think this is one of your best dishes. Graham is so impressed, he wants to bottle up Tommy's tomato jam. Awesome, this is the deal right here, and this is what will get you further in the competition. Thank you so much. Heck, I'd buy a jar too. Now, before I end this video, don't forget to let me know your pick for the most important chef in the competition. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And if you think this video is crazy, then make sure to check out the next video right here. It's even better.